Praise the Lord. Yeah, praise the Lord. Now, who is, uh, is, who's taking care of our children? I, I know this is not the normal time that our children are dismissed. We usually sing a little bit more. But today, I'm going to preach to you longer. Not, 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 y'all stay where you are. Be still. <laughs> That's not necessarily true. I'm just, uh, uh, our, uh, our music department's been a little bit uh, decimated. So anyway, it's just a little bit shorter. I want to, let me tell you, give you the, um, a, a little premise about uh, the series that we're about to enter into for the next uh, four or five weeks or so. Uh, hopefully next four or five weeks. It might stretch a little bit more, but my plans are for the next four or five weeks. And, <clears throat> you know, Tan, Pastor Tanya and I, when during the Christmas holidays and so forth, uh, I, of course, I'm studying uh, all the time, and, and we're doing things that we normally do, uh, even when it's not Christmas time. And, but around that time, things kind of slow down, and, and you have time to uh, reflect on some things uh, longer than normal because of the schedules and so forth of what happens with the messages and the music and all of Christmas. Well, this year, uh, I was studying and, and really seeking the Lord about what what he would have me to begin with and to start this year with. And as I began to think and we began to talk together, I said, you know, the one thing that you hear most often among Christians, church people, when they, when they talk about messages and, 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 and sermons, and the one thing that they say is, you know, I want to hear messages that are relevant. And by that, they mean uh, that matter, uh, that it makes a difference what you hear, that it affects you in some way to create change in your life that God would be pleased with because we all know that when we're first saved, we start with, <laughs> with nothing and God has lots to work on before as he matures us and as we grow. Well, of course, the major tool that God uses is his word, the Bible. The only trouble with that is that the Bible is filled with hundreds and maybe even thousands of verses and concepts that protect, pertain to areas of life. And it sometimes becomes very difficult to decipher these things and you just get overwhelmed with the information and how it all ties together and what it's about. And, and, and sometimes it's almost like, man, I, I just, I, I, don't, I can't understand all this. And you just kind of uh, give up and, and decide to uh, make it the best you can, so to speak. Well, through the years, uh, you know, and, and of course being involved in church and pastoring and, and music and youth and worshiping and missionary, all that, everything, um, I have found that people want their lives to be changed and affected by God, and they want to become uh, capable and mature. And they look at other people's lives that they consider to be faithful and capable and mature. And I mean, you know, those people you don't know. By the way, the only perfect people in the world are people that you don't know. If you know any of them, you know that they're not perfect. And I'm gonna tell you, whether they're big ones or little ones or anybody in between, uh, everybody has issues in life. But we want to be the, the, the best we can be, to borrow a phrase, and we want to please God. So how can, how can we grow? I mean, what is it that will affect our lives so that we could say, all right, if I do this, then it is guaranteed that I'm going to grow, that I, my life is going to become more capable, more Christ-like, more usable, uh, more mature, better prepared, and all of those kind of things. Because people come to church their whole life looking for that answer. That's what they're looking for. And they're thinking, well, maybe this message this week will help me come to some conclusions and some help in these things. And then maybe next week or maybe, and, and so your life becomes a search. So I, I asked Pastor Tanya, I said, would it help you 
If I could synthesize all of the stuff that the scripture says, the verses and the, and the concepts from all these other places, because you know, nothing is simply affected by one single little verse about it. There's, it's the context and the accumulation of everything the scripture says, not just one verse. You can take a couple of verses in the Bible by themselves and basically uh, uh, create any kind of doctrine you want, like uh, Judas went out and hung himself. What thou do, doest likewise. And what you do, do quickly. Well, that would be a doctrine for going out and quickly hanging yourself. But we know the Bible doesn't teach that because there are lots of contexts and lots of things that are contrary to that. Well, everything is like that. All understandings are like that. So uh, I said, all right, let me see if with the Lord's <laughs> provision, I can uh, create some, and I'm gonna call them, I'm gonna call them laws for lack of a better word to use. A, a better word might be conclusions, but we'll just call them laws for the sake of something to call them. To create 10 laws about the areas of our life that seem to be the most uh, talked about in the scripture and the most vulnerable to the enemy and see if I can help us and, and, and you guys out there to have something in your life that will change your life. I mean, guaranteed, if, you, if, if these become part of your life, you accept this, you do it, you receive it, I will guarantee you that it will change your life because every one of these are direct principles from God's word about these major areas of our life. And I'm gonna start with the, with, with the apex of consideration today, and it is our mind. What does the scripture say about our mind? You remember, remember a few weeks ago, maybe a few months ago now, uh, I preached a whole series on the transformed mind, and we spent four or five weeks just talking about uh, how your mind is transformed and what it changes to and what changes it. Well, all right, what does the scripture say? That's only one little aspect of, of what the Bible says about your mind. So what are the 10 most important things that the Bible says about our mind that, will, it, that, it, that if we obey these principles, these laws, it will change our life? and it'll move us more toward Christ. Out of all the hundreds of things, I looked up just, uh, just a little quick uh, scan yesterday. I said, I wonder how many times this word's used. And I, I went to a concordance, and it's easy now because everything you know, is electronic and digital, so you can just check things real quickly. Um, and I checked on the word, uh, on the word um, uh, think. No, I changed, yeah, I checked on thinking. It was used like 68 times. Mind was used like 163 times. Meditate was used 43 times. I mean, you get the point. Any word that you use for thinking, meditating, considering your mind, I mean, these, that's the number of scriptures that have that word in it, much less the concepts that go with that. So it's just a whole bunch of stuff. All right, so let's see if I can, can narrow this down to the top 10. And I'm gonna try to get all these 10, and I know... You guys are going, oh no, uh, oh no. We did need some extra time. But I'm, I'm gonna try to move on through them, okay? Because I want you to see all of them at one time is what I'm doing. I'm not trying to stretch this thing out. I, I, I think it's, it'll be some value in seeing all of these 10 at the same time, all right, in the same meeting. And I start with the mind because uh, your mind controls everything. There was, a, there was a phrase, by the way, this phrase was used in 1971. I was shocked to find out it was so old. A mind is a terrible thing to waste. That came out in 1971 as an advertising campaign for uh, colleges and so forth. A mind is a terrible thing to waste. And it is, because the mind controls everything. I mean, it controls what I am, it controls uh, what I do, it controls where I'm going, uh, whatever my mind says is true, and I know you've experienced this, Whatever my mind tells me is true, is true to me, regardless. Solomon said it this way in Proverbs 23, as a man thinks in his heart, 
so is he. So the conclusion is that the mind is the most, uh, the most vulnerable weapon that God has in his armor for our, armory for our lives to be affected. And I'm going to read a passage. This is the Apostle Paul talking about the kind of mind that Jesus had, the mind of Christ that we talk about so often. It's Philippians chapter 2, and we're going to read a few verses, first, starting with verse 1. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if there's any comfort of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Now, let me just say, after 50 years of working with people, this is not easy to accomplish, right? <laughs> That we would be of one mind, one accord, one thought. All right, that's not easy to do, but it is extremely powerful. This is an extremely powerful spiritual principle called the, uh, called the principle of agreement, where we agree in the spirit with one another. It's a tremendously powerful aspect of the Christian life and the work of the Holy Spirit in all of our lives. That's why Jesus said, where there are any two of you, uh, agree on anything, touching heaven. You can ask of my father and he'll do it. Uh, it takes only two, you know? So, so it's very important that we be together, so forth. All right, verse three. Let nothing be done through selfish ambi ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Now, this is dealing with that tremendously competitive human nature that we have where we want to be large and in charge. So he tells us that we are to think this is not a campaign for low self-esteem. I know some people read this verse and they think, well, he's telling, us not, uh, he's telling us to think less of ourselves. But if you'll read it real good, you'll see that God is not telling us to think less of ourselves. He's telling us to think more of others. And so he says, with lowliness of mind, esteem others better than yourself. Verse four, let each of you look not only on his own interest, but also on the interest of others. Everybody say, it's not all about me. That's what he's saying. Life is not all about me. In a family, in your family, it's not all about what you want. It's not about what you know, you want to eat, what, what you want to watch on TV, what time you want to go to bed. I mean, you have a whole group of people and every decision affects the whole group, right? Not just one individual within the group. So he said, look, don't just think about yourself. It's not all about you, but think about others. So the mind of Christ then becomes a mind, obviously, where Jesus lays his rights down. He lays his desires, desires aside for the sake of someone else. So let's get to the first law. And the first law, many of these uh, studies that we do in the next few weeks, there are 10 laws and it doesn't matter what order you put them in. I mean, there's not like one to start with and then they get less and greater and so forth. Uh, but this one is. This one that comes first here is the greatest and the most important law of your mind, because without it, uh, nothing else is gonna work for you. And here's the first law, the law of a servant. Our mind has to become the mind of a servant. Christ laid down his privileges. He laid down his rights in heaven to come down here to earth and to die for us. This is the mind of Christ. You say, what kind of mind did Jesus have? Well, let's continue with the verses. Verse five again. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery. And that little phrase just means he didn't consider it something to be grasped after, to be equal with God. Jesus did not think that it was important and valuable for everybody on earth to think of him as God. He said, it doesn't matter what they think about me. All that matters is my mission and my purpose and, what it, and how it affects them. So Jesus said, look, 
Doesn't matter what you say or what you think about me, verse seven, but made himself of no reputation. Now that doesn't say not much reputation. That says no reputation. Taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So the cross changes the way I look at things. And changing from selfishness to servanthood means that you die to yourself on the cross of your own life as, if, as, as Jesus died for himself on the cross and that your existence becomes not to serve yourself but to serve others. Christ left all that was in heaven, all of the privileges, and he took on humanity and he died for us and having the mind of Christ means that it's not all about you but life then becomes all about others and serving others and blessing others in life. This comes directly in conflict with the major teaching of today, and that is, I'm gonna use the word entitlement. If you look around our world today, one of the major problems we have in this world we're living in right now is that everybody thinks they're entitled. And they're being taught this, that, that we owe them something, that they deserve something. When, when an act of service is performed, how do you respond? Are you gracious about it? Are you thankful for it? Do you, you know, I mean, do you respond with, with some appreciation and stuff? Or is it, well, you know, I'm the boss, I deserve that. They owe me that, I, you know. Uh, that's the attitude that conflicts with the law of servanthood. Now, we're going nowhere unless in our mind we can put on the mind of Christ, which is the mind of a servant. And I'm gonna tell you something, in a marriage relationship, this is not a series about marriage relationships, but I'm just gonna tell you, or any relationship, you're going nowhere in that relationship if you're not gonna be a servant. Look for ways to serve. It, it, that's the basis of relationship. Number two, law number two, the law of generations. Now, you may not think this is a law of the mind, but, but I want to show you that it is. And I call it the law of generations. And I'm going to go to Exodus 20. This is the uh, Ten Commandments, obviously, and read a few verses. Verse one, Exodus 20. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. Of course, that's the first commandment. Here comes the second commandment. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. Now what this passage is identifying, it is identifying the fact that we are all affected by our generations that have come before us. That none of us just plop here on earth with no heritage, no genetics, no uh, family lineages, that all of us are affected by what has come before us in our families, whether that's good or bad. Now, in this particular passage, he's talking about generational curses. And generational curses, don't let, I mean, don't let that sound more than it is. It just simply means that the generations that have come before you have been involved in things the scripture identifies it as iniquity. Now, iniquity is a special kind of sin. It, it gets translated for the most time, the word sin, but it's a special kind of sin. And I've said this to you before, and I know you, know, you remember everything I say, so there's no reason to say it again. But for the sake of these people watching, they might not have ever heard this before. The word iniquity means to twist or to bend. 
Uh, if you can picture, uh, you know, the old uh, 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 plastic uh, uh, flowers that we used to have. I saw in a church I pastored, my first church way, 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 way back, we had, a, we had an old Dearborn heater that sat in the sanctuary and they had, ladies had flowers and, and they were artificial and back then they were plastic. Well, one Saturday night, I came in to light the heater, keep it on low so Sunday morning it'd be warm. And I didn't notice that the flowers, the plastic flowers were on top of the heater. I didn't really just even think about it at all. Well, when I came in the next morning, I was the first one in the building. I noticed on the Dearborn heater was just this glob of melted plastic like that. Well, before they were nice formed flowers. They looked beautiful. They were colorful and all. Now they're just a blob of twisted mess. That's iniquity. Iniquity is the twisting and the perverting of God's truth. Well, in our families, because sometimes of genetics, because of the history of our family, because of the things we're taught, the things we experience, uh, the things that go on in our families, the attitudes and all of those things, that affects the way we think and the way we live our life. So God says that in every life, we have a choice to either move against him and create generational curses that travel, God said it travels down to the third and the fourth generations. Or we can break those generational curses by loving him and obeying him and we can begin uh, uh, and start uh, a new life. Now, what I have discovered in my life as a Christian, that I come from a family with many generational curses and I know that many of you would feel the same and, and know the same about your families. That I was the first one in my, in my family to ever come to the Lord. I was 16 years old. We did, nobody in my family was a Christian and nobody even knew a Christian that I know of. And the Lord began to work in my life through uh, another friend that was lost himself and somehow the Lord brought me to a church and, 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 and held me there by a, an attraction to all the other young people that were there at that time and long enough to speak to my heart and tell me what I needed to know in order to come to him and for my life to be affected. Well, from that point forward, everybody in my family began to come to the Lord over a period of time. Everybody began to come to the Lord. Well, of course, what happened to these generational curses? Well, the generational curse of alcohol that had killed all of my uncles and my grandfather, uh, it was dealt with. And, 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 and that alcoholism began to disappear. And now in our family lineage, there's not that alcoholism. I'm just saying that, that generational curses are something that we have to break in our lives so that our minds can be free from these things. Now, I, I wrote just a little prayer and I wanna read it to you. This is, if you wanted to break a generational curse, what, what would you do? All right, here I just wrote it and I should have maybe given it to you. It's a very simple little prayer. Thank you, Father, for the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross that cleanses me from sin and sets me free from the generational curses that make me vulnerable to my enemy. Please forgive me for my wrong attitudes and my wrong actions and the wrong attitudes and actions of my parents and my grandparents and those that have come before me. And I now receive freedom from, and then you can just put whatever it is, you know, curses or uh, anger, hostility, uh, greed, uh, prejudice, alcohol, hatred, whatever it might be, I now receive freedom from, and you name it, and I bind the enemy in Jesus' name and ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit so that I'm empowered to live in victory. Amen. Something simple, very simple like that. It's not, it doesn't have to be a production. It just has to be something that you determine that is, this is what you're gonna do in life and you're gonna go forth. And here's the thing I found. If I don't do these things, then my children have to do them. If I leave things hanging around that I should have dealt with, then somebody that follows after me, my children or my grandchildren, somebody's gonna have to deal with these one day. 
And so it is my determination, Lord, help me deal with what I need to deal with so that for the rest of the lineage of my family, my family, somebody else doesn't have to try to deal with this 15 years from now when I should have nipped it in the bud right now. So the second law, law of generations, I know I'm taking too much time. Third law, the law of tolerance. The law of tolerance. Here it is in Luke chapter six, beginning verse 39. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. So Jesus is teaching us that um, we're going to be judged by the same standard we use to judge others, and that if we're gonna be rigid and we're gonna be inflexible and we're gonna uh, deal with this perfection complex in life, then our life's gonna really be unhappy because that's not gonna produce anything but failure in life. Going on with verse 39, and he spoke a parable to them. Can, a blind, can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into the ditch? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but you do not perceive the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, brother, let me remove the speck that is in your eye, when you yourself did not see the plank that is in your own eye? Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you can, can see clearly to remove the speck that is in your brother's eye. So this parable is encouraging us to back off of that perfection standard that we can so easily be drawn into and give a little room in people's life for imperfection because you're not perfect either. And, I mean, and now I pronounce you husband and wife. You may kiss the bride. And presto, change boom. Everything's wonderful from that point on. Is that true? No, you know that's not true. The one thing that Tanya and I have learned after 44 years of marriage, you know what marriage is? Commitment to an imperfect person. And it always will be because we won't be perfect until Christ changes us in heaven. So uh, in our mind, we need tolerance. When I was in the eighth grade, and some of the people from Meridian probably listening, Northwest Junior High, I had a shop teacher. That, well, back then they called it industrial arts. And industrial arts, you had to make projects. You had to make a metal project, uh, a wood project, a leather project, and a plastic project. And you had to build them from scratch, and you had to do everything. You had to cut them out, you had to sand them, you had to you know, uh, fasten them, you had to grind them, you had to lay them, you had to do everything you had to do. And this was called industrial arts. Mr. Henry was my teacher, a man of great patience. Well, it was in industrial arts in making these projects that I learned about this law of tolerance. Because in every building project, you have to have a certain amount of tolerance in every, in every function, every cut, every uh, uh, placement together. Every, in other words, there is a perfect standard by which all of this is measured. But because machines are not perfect, humans are not perfect, you have to leave a little tolerance, which means deviation from the perfection. You have to leave a little tolerance so that, that you can, can make this thing. If you don't, you, you couldn't build it because you're not perfect and neither will it be. There will be a little deviation. Now, in life, this comes across in how we deal with people and, how, and what we expect from others. And by tolerance, if you, you know, you've been around people that demand perfection of, of, of everything, and it's just a horrible way to live. So sometimes you have to develop in your mind an attitude of, all right, I am going to accept something in life that is not perfect. Uh, there's a standard 
carpenters have and brick masons have and maybe others have too. It's called plumb. When something's plumb, it, it's, it's right on it. It's, it's perfect in its, in, its, uh, in its directions and so forth. But everything in life, and you've heard me say this before, may not be plumb, plumb. But maybe it's plumb sum. And sometimes plumb sum has to be good enough. So tolerance, the law of the mind, is tolerance. Here's the fourth law, the law of respect. What you, thinks, what you think affects how you act. And how you act affects relationships. Whether you treat others with love and respect, uh, whether you treat each other with disrespect and dishonor, I mean, uh, that is a mentality that we have. Here's this mentality spoken to us in one verse. Ephesians 5, verse 33. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, but let the wife see that she respects her husband. Now, I'm gonna talk about the law of respect in connection with families. And the reason why is because it's just really easy to see this in families. It's, it's easy to lose respect for your family members. Why is this? Because you know so much about them. Other people that may not know them like you do would look at them and say, man, your brother is a 10, you know? And you say, that jugger's a one, he don't even count. Why? Because you know everything about him. You know warts, blemishes, wrinkles, and all. You know everything. And so it's really easy to lose respect for people, whether it would be friends or family members, but people that you're, that you're with and people that you're around because you just get so much information. And like I said before, the only saints in life are the people that we don't know, uh, you know, and we don't know all that stuff about them. But there's an old saying that says, Familiarity breeds contempt. And that is so true. Familiarity also breeds something else. It breeds complacency, which can be very detrimental when it comes to any of our relationships that we have. I mean, let, uh, guys, when you were dating, did, did you open the car door for your, for your wife or what may be you, your wife now? You know, back then, and I know you'll remember this, back then we, did, we, we, could only op we could open our door and they could get in on our side and sit right there by us. I mean, you've seen, it, you've seen these two-headed monsters going down the road. Well, nowadays, because of bucket seats and so forth, and consoles, blah, blah, that might be a little more difficult to do. But you'd be surprised how many, how many guys... They used to be the emperor of romance. They used to be so uh, respectful and so forth that they would just run around. I told Tanya when we were dating, and, and I mean, we were just kids, 16 years old, 17 years old. And I told her uh, one day, I said, "Hun, if you will let me, if you'll wait and you'll let me, I will open the door for you. And she's never forgotten that. For 44 years later, uh, we're still doing that. But I mean, when's the last time you opened your door for your wife? See, you can get so complacent. You say, well, back in mm, 1970, uh, yeah. well, try it again. Now, you, you know, you're gonna have to be gentle about it and you're gonna have to carry you some smelling salts in your pocket and be ready to pick her up off the, off the parking lot out there when you, when you actually do this. But I mean, those are the kind of things. Uh, respect, I mean, open, when, the, when you walk in a building, open the door for them. Just simple as that. Uh, let them go first. You know, when you sit down with, a, with your plate at supper time or wherever it might be, uh, don't just start eating. Wait until they get there before you start eating. I mean, just little simple things, just respectful things like that. You know, and, and, and ladies, when you walk past that couch on Saturday afternoon and your man is laying there, uh, typically watching the ball game through his eyelids, and he's got that half-eaten bag of pig skins on his chest and a, and a glass of uh, something on the floor down there. And his stomach's hanging about halfway off the couch. And when you walk by there, everything within you, the enemy looks at you and says, look at that bird, would you? Can you believe you married that? 
and everything within you is shouting, disrespect, disrespect, disrespect. Just remember that, uh, that you married them and it's, your, and it's your obligation to be respectful. Just walk over there and gently pat him and say, that's my baby or you know, whatever you might say. And those children, you know, the, the children may not be road scholars. They might not be professional athletes. They might not make any who's who list for anything. But what would you do without them? I mean, your whole world would stop if something happened to one of them. They're so precious. Respect is what it's about. It starts right at home. It starts in life with the people that are most common to us. And people know when they're being respected and when they're not. Law number five, the law of freedom. Law of freedom, here's Galatians chapter six, verse 13. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. This verse is saying that God intends for us to live in freedom every day. And When we tolerate bondage, it affects everyone around me and every relationship that I have. Bad thinking, bad choices, bad habits. Not only limit me, but it limits everybody around me. If I'm late for everything I do, and everybody else is ready and dressed and ready to go, and I'm the one that they're always waiting on, and I'm late for everything in life. And my attitude is, well, y'all are just going to be late because I'm not ready, and I'll be ready when I get ready. But the problem with that is that not only affects you, it affects everybody else because they're riding with you. So whatever bondages we allow in our life not only affect us, but affects everybody else in our life. Uh, Alcoholism, uh, drug abuse, uh, bad tempers, anger, uh, hostility. I mean, just, you could name them, just go down and listen. These are not just things that affect me. These are things that affect the people around me. And according to Galatians 5, the Lord intends for us to live in liberty and not to be in bondage in life because bondage affects everybody around us, not just me. If I walk in bondage, my children are in bondage. My wife is in bondage. The people that love me are in bondage if I allow bondage to be in my life. All right, law number six, the law of hope. Romans five, therefore being justified by faith, We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. This just simply means that anyone can change. I mean, look at how much you've changed. When the, when the Lord found you, how were you? And what's happened in your life since then? So if you can change, basically what this verse is saying is anyone can change in life. And that Hope is, is vital for my mental state of life. I know this sounds like a refrigerator slogan, but uh, you can't cope without hope. That sounds like some slogan, doesn't it? Yeah, I think some, I've heard some people say that before. You can't cope without hope. Well, this is true because hope affects my mentality. Let me show you what I mean. And when, when we come to church, What we are coming for is to have our faith strengthened. Here's a verse that says that, Hebrews 11, chapter one. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. So when I'm coming to church, what I'm hoping for is 
that something is going to be done that day that builds my faith. And then the verse in Romans 10, 17 says, how does faith come? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So when I come to church, I hear the word of God and it builds my faith. But faith is simply a, and you've, I've broken this for you before, substance. Sub meaning below and stance meaning to stand. So something that, that, that stands below my faith that my faith stands on is called hope. So if I don't have any hope, then my faith has nothing to do. I can come to church, but it doesn't affect me because my 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 faith is not supporting anything because my hope is gone. And so you may be disappointed in yourself. You may be disappointed in other people. Uh, there have been so many promises that they'll change and, and the situations will change, but that doesn't happen. And all the scripture is saying, look, don't lose hope because I can testify that I have seen God uh, change lives, change thoughts, uh, reverse circumstances, uh, take hopeless things and, and, and change and affect them in, in a moment. So the scripture says hope is a mental attitude that we have to have in order to function properly in life. Let me give you a, a verse. This is out of Job, Job 14. Job 14, Job is talking about the woes of life. And he says in verse 14, verse seven, for there is hope for a tree if it is cut down, everyone say a stump. Okay, so if you cut a tree down, it becomes what? A stump, right? For there is hope for a tree that if it is cut down, that it will sprout again and that its tender shoots will not cease. You may be a stump right now. Your life may be, the tree of your life may have been cut down. What is, what is Job saying to us? Job is saying the hope of our life is that even though we may be a stump right now, that there is still life in us and that we will sprout again and that God will work in the, in the tender branches of our life. So it, it's almost like God has said, all right, close your eyes. All right, do you, do you see a stump? Yeah, I see a stump, that's me. All right, can you, see, can you see leaves beginning to branch out of that stump? Can you see life beginning to move out of that stump? See, that's hope. That's hope that, that things will be, again, my relationship, my, my life, my, that person that I'm dealing with can be, can, can be whole again. And, and, and that's hope in my life. Hope is not a wish, by the way. Hope, and I came up with this definition a long time ago. Uh, hope is a well-founded, well-grounded expectation for the future. There, in other words, hope is not a wish. There's a reason I have hope. It's grounded on something. There's, there's something that tells me I can have hope and I can believe, and it's well-founded that there is something that makes that true and, and makes it believable. It's not just a wish. It's a well-founded, well-grounded expectation for the future. All right, let me give you number seven. Number seven is the law of order. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 40. Let all things be done decently and in order. That's saying simple is better, right? Because our lives can get so cluttered up, can't they? So much stuff. Uh, it may be my personal bias, but I believe that uh, all this clutter brings confusion in life. Nehemiah was sent back to Jerusalem by God to rebuild the wall that had been torn down. Ezra rebuilt the temple, Nehemiah rebuilds the wall. At one point in the project, this is I think along chapter four, at one point in the project, they stop, they have to stop building the wall. You know why? Because the, the verse says there was so much clutter. In other words, there was so much debris and so much 
clutter that it halted the forward progress of rebuilding the wall. So this verse is saying, I believe, get things in order. In your life, order is vital to your life. I mean, get, get out there and, 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 and clean out that garage. You know, we, we live in, in the only country in the world where we fill our garage up with stuff we can't sell at a garage sale and we leave sixty, seventy thousand $70,000 automobiles <laughs> sitting out in the driveway. Too much stuff. Clean it up. Uh, while you're at it, clean out the car, you know? <laughs> I mean, last time I checked, it might take a backhoe to get back in there. Get in the attic storage, and I know I'm meddling in people's business now. Fix that leaky faucet. Haul off that pile of rotten lumber that's been there since Hurricane Zeta hit it, you know? I mean, get the clutter out of your life. Ladies, get those clothes, uh, closets cleaned out, those cabinets cleaned out. I mean, it might improve your disposition if every time you went to get to a bowl of cereal, half the Tupperware wouldn't fall out on you, you know? Pick up, straighten up, fold clothes. Disorder and clutter affect your mind. It makes you feel like everything's falling apart. So order... Order is absolutely necessary for your mind to be restored in life. You can't go into confusion and have your mind restored. All right, law number, closely related to that is this this next law, law eight, the law of peace. 1 Corinthians 14, 33. For God is not the author of confusion. Everybody say disorder. God is not the author of disorder, but of peace as in all the churches of the saints. And we love Psalm 23. People know Psalm 23 that don't even know the Lord. I mean, they've heard it so many times at funerals and places like that. Everybody knows the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. What does the next line say? He makes me lie down in green pastures. that's, That's pretty much true, isn't it? He has to make us. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Why does he do this? He restores my soul. In order for my soul to be restored, I have to have peace in my life. I have to, my my soul is my seat of intellect. My soul is is. The, my personality, my emotions, my will. Uh, it, it's that, it's that, that, that thinking part of me. You're listening to me with your soul. You're making decisions with your soul. For my soul to be restored, I have to be in a, in a place of peace. So what is the truth that's being dealt with here? It is that sometimes... We simply need to unplug in life. I mean, we go to work and, and, and we work all day and the phone's ringing and the voices are talking and the motors are running and the machinery's running and then you get in your, you get in your automobile to come home and the radio's blaring and the traffic's bustling around you and you finally get home and every TV in every room is on and it's blasting and blaring and the, and the stereo or the uh, computer or uh, more phones ringing and, 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 and you get the attitude, it's almost like, holy ghost, take me away. It's like David said, oh, that I had wings like a dove that I might fly away and be at rest. Well, Every once in a while, we, we need to be like David and we need to fly away and be at rest. I mean, take a little sabbatical every now and then. Overnight, leave the children with the grandparents. <laughs> we seem to inherit a lot of that. And get, get, get away. Oh, and, and, and I hear you say, well, I can't afford to do that and I don't have enough time off from work. Well, I mean, well, when you get home, go down to the beach, walk. I mean, there are beautiful boardwalks and everything down there built for, for our tourists and everybody else. It's just wonderful. Just, I mean, it doesn't cost you a dime. Just go down there and take a little stroll. Or get on your back porch. You know that one that you bought those rocking chairs for a couple of hundred dollars a piece that were so comfortable and you hadn't even sat in them since you got them. Or that porch swing that you almost killed yourself hanging 
It's really nice. It's comfortable. Get out there, turn the fan on, you know, get your little breeze blowing and enjoy some life with that. It takes peace for us to replenish in our brain. There, there are two things specifically that we need in order to refurbish our, our soul, and that is order. You're not gonna do it in clutter and confusion and peace. We need order and peace for our lives, for our brains, for our mentalities to be restored. All right, law number nine. Law number nine is the law of purity. Philippians chapter four, verse eight. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. This says that this is what your mind needs to be full of. It needs to be full of things that are lovely, things that are worthy, things that are pure, things that are of good report, things that are virtuous in life. Well, it's easy to get sucked into entertainment. That's anything but any of that. And to find ourselves being entertained by things that are full of turmoil and greed and anger and deceit and hostility and lust and fear. And, 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 and how can we expect to have any purity in our life if our lives are filled with things that are diametrically opposed to what God said my, my life should be full of. It's kind of like that old computer phrase, right? Garbage in, garbage out. I mean, what I, men, what we see with our eyes. Ladies, uh, your ear gate. Uh, what we allow to come in through those affect the way we think, affect the way we feel, affect how we look at life. You know, we, we can't let those things Linger. They they put they 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 put a hole in our soul. They make it easy for the enemy to just to drag us back into things that that we've left far behind because we've left that door open, and our mind is not pure. Now I know that there's no way to avoid totally the things of this world, and I, I I'm aware of that. But whenever you get a choice. Make a wise choice about what you put your brain, what you put in your brain. It really does matter a lot. All right, number 10, last one. The law of forgiveness. In Ephesians 4, verse 31 and 32, Paul says, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, which just means angry yelling, by the way, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Malice means desire to injure. Let all that be put away from you and be kind to one another. By the way, the Aramaic word for kind means be sweet. And be sweet to one another tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. 2,000 years ago, Jesus went to the cross, suffered all that he did. He was mocked, he was beaten, he was abused, nailed to the cross so that we could be forgiven all of our sin. I mean, isn't that amazing? I mean, isn't, isn't that don't we feel such a relief because of that, that I am blessed and I am forgiven that Jesus suffered all of this stuff so that I could be forgiven of all of my sins. Now, what the law of forgiveness says is, what are you gonna do with those who need forgiveness from you? Are you going to release it? Well, let me read this verse to you and, and then I'll mention that. John 20, you have two choices. 
Here are your two choices, John 20. And when he had said this, this is Jesus, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. So according to John 20, Jesus speaking, there are two choices I have to do with, that have to do with forgiveness for me. I have two choices. I can release it or I can retain it. I mean, think back now. Is there a person that did something in your life that was so horrible, so hurtful, that cut you so deep and hurt you so bad that you have never been able to release it? If, you, if there is someone there, then you have retained it. And if you wonder why, you can just have tremendous burst, outbursts of anger. Uh, you can be so volatile in certain situations. You, you can seemingly maybe even find yourself desiring uh, to do something that was done to you or, or, or that sin just kind of invades you. Uh, those are all evidences that you have not released this thing but that you have retained it. And when you retained it, it's poisoning you. It's poisoning your family and your life and the people that are around you. Look, forgiveness is not for other people. Forgiveness is for you so that it doesn't keep eating you and killing you and poisoning your life. I've, I've used a, a, a picture, an analogy for this that... Uh, Hate and unforgiveness is an acid that does more damage to the container in which it is stored than on the victim on which it is poured. And it's for your benefit that God says forgive. See, this is a mentality. This is a, this is a mindset. Uh, release it. Remove that hook from your soul. I, I thought about it this way. Listen, I've had some of these. I mean, I guarantee you I've had some of these. I, I've had some that for years I didn't let go of. I mean, I would have, it was just as fresh 10 years later as it was the day it happened. And you know what it does? It just kills you. Yeah, you're the only one suffering for this. Forgiveness is grace for, for you, not for them. They don't even know probably and they don't care. Uh, they go home and sleep every night just as easy as everything. They don't even know. And you're sitting here boiling, thinking, what you going to do to get them back? And I'll say this, and if they do that, I'm going to do that. Now I'm telling you, I should have did this. Ooh! And your adrenaline's pumping and everything, and you're waking up at 3 o'clock in the morning, running that stuff through your mind, and you're, you're torturing yourself. And so I got to thinking about it like this. All right, let's just say I was... I had come upon someone that really harmed me and I was having trouble forgiveness in an accident somewhere. And I get out of my vehicle and I go over and they're bleeding and they're obviously dying. And I'm, and I'm picking, I'm, 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 I'm holding their head up, trying to comfort them in some way. And, and, and they're in their last moments of consciousness. What am I going to say to them? I mean, am I going to say things that would try to comfort them, try to ease their, their pain at this moment? Or would I bring that stuff up again and, and taunt them about the fact that they did evil to me one day? See, that's the picture that we have of forgiveness. That forgiveness is for you. And it's time to take that stuff to the cross and put it at the cross. Because wouldn't it be terrible if Jesus did that for us? How, guil 
How, how guilty would we be if Jesus had no forgiveness for our life? So anyway, these are the 10 laws of the mind. These are the things that need to happen in our mind in order for our life to change. This is what the scripture says about our mind. The law of the servant, the law of generations, law of tolerance, law of respect, law of freedom, law of hope, law of order, law of peace, law of purity, and law of forgiveness. It'll change your life. You say, I want to be different. I want to change. All right, here, here it is. Ten things that we practice every day. All right, bow your head with me one moment, would you please? <laughs>